let me start with a quote. Symmetry as wide or as narrow as you may define its meaning is one idea by which man through the ages has tried to comprehend and create order, beauty and perfection. These are the words of Hermann Weil, one of the 20th century best mathematicians who also played a crucial role in creating the mathematical foundations of modern physics. The word symmetry comes from Greek. Ancient Greeks believed that symmetric polyhedra, what we nowadays call platonic solids, were the basic geometric building blocks of all the matter in the universe. And if you think of it a little bit, it's actually not that far from our modern understanding of how crystals are organized. Greeks also are credited as the creators of geometry, which they considered the queen of all sciences. And the foundations of geometry we still study at school today were laid down by Euclid in his famous Elements, where he proposed a set of five axioms, or what he called postulates, from which his entire geometry could be derived. And one of these postulates, that you can pass only one parallel to a line through a point outside it, seemed to stand out and for over a thousand years, a line of illustrious mathematicians broke their teeth trying to prove it, but all in vain. Euclid's fifth postulate stood undisputable until the 19th century when the realization suddenly came that it was not necessary and one could construct different types of geometry that were given the name non-Euclidean. And at that time, you should understand that such ideas were considered complete heresy that even Carl Friedrich Gauss himself, one of the greatest mathematicians of all times, he was called the Princeps Mathematicorum in his lifetime, he didn't dare to publish his ideas and results on these new types of geometries, and others, like Nikolai Lobachevsky, did dare and were subjected to public shaming and humiliation by his colleagues. But time passed, and towards the end of the 19th century, it became quite acceptable to have other geometries outside the Euclidean world. So Euclid's monopoly, after being unchallenged for 2,000 years, has finally come to an end. But together with it, it brought a new problem that now, instead of one accepted single geometry, there was an entire zoo of different geometries, such as hyperbolic, elliptic, affine, or projective. And these geometries were studied independently. It was not clear how they're related to each other, and what actually defines a geometry. So that was obviously a mess and unhealthy situation, and the way out of this pickle was shown by a young German mathematician called Felix Klein. He was appointed in 1872 as a professor in the small Bavarian University of Erlangen. And in a research paper that entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program, named after the university where he worked, Klein proposed approaching geometry in a radically different way, as the study of invariants or symmetries. So these are the properties of objects that remain unchanged when you subject an object to some class of transformations. For example, Klein showed that Euclidean geometry arises from rigid motions that preserve many properties such as angles, areas, or parallel lines. So this approach unified the geometries that were known at the time including the hyperbolic geometry of Lobachevsky or the spherical geometry of Freeman into a single common framework. It also allowed to derive geometry from first principles of symmetry that was formalized using a new branch of mathematics that was given the name group theory that was also born in the 19th century. And Klein's Erlangen program brought a big change in mindset in geometry, in mathematics more broadly it was a cultural transformation, but it also spilled into other disciplines, in particular into physics. And the first half of the 20th century was extremely fruitful and revolutionary in physics, with a series of results like the works of Amy Neuter, Hermann Weil that I already mentioned, Young and Mills, they showed that even the very fundamental properties of our world, such as the structure of the space-time itself, or different types of forces that exist in the universe, they could all be derived from first principles of symmetry. So I think it's, uh, it's hard to put it better than once Philip Anderson, a Nobel winning physicist said that it's only slightly overstating the case to say that physics is the study of symmetry. Now you may wonder at this point, why am I telling you about physics and geometry? I'm a computer scientist and I was invited here to talk about deep learning. So to me, I think the current state of, of affairs 
in the field of deep learning reminds a lot of the situation in geometry in the 19th century. So on the one hand, I think it's indisputable that in the past decade or so, deep learning has brought a revolution in data science and made possible many tasks that maybe just a decade ago would be considered almost science fiction, such as computer vision, speech recognition, natural language understanding and translation, playing intelligent games such as Go and winning over human champions, or more recently even protein folding, the, the holy grail of structural biology. On the other hand, we now also have a zoo of different neural network architectures, and some of them are powering your everyday life, like your favorite search engine, or your favorite social network, or even voice recognition, or your smartphone. And these architectures, these neural networks, were historically developed for different kinds of problems or different types of data, and they all have very few uh, unifying principles. And deep learning is frequently criticized as a kind of new alchemy in the sense that sometimes these neural networks work amazingly well and we don't understand why, and in some other cases they don't work and we also don't understand why. And geometric deep learning is an attempt to provide a geometric unification of the field, allowing us to derive deep neural network architectures mathematically from first principles of symmetry and invariance exactly in the spirit of Klein's Erlangen program. So if we look at machine learning, at least in its simple setting, what is called supervised learning, it is essentially a problem of function estimation. So let's say that we want to tell apart images of cats and dogs. And this is a toy example of a computer vision problem akin to what you may find, for example, in a self-driving car, just in a much simpler uh, setting and way. So here we are given examples of images of cats and dogs, what is called the training set. And we want to find a function, some black box that fits this data and is able to predict correct outputs for images that we have never previously seen. So the question is what to put in such a black box. And since the late 50s, the answer was uh, artificial neural networks. So, so these neural networks in a very simplified and abstracted form were a mathematical model of how the brain cells are connected and learn. So of course the brain works differently, but that was a mathematical simplification. And one such simple architecture called the perceptron was developed by Frank Rosenblatt in the late 50s at Cornell University, and he showed very encouraging success in recognizing simple patterns and images, which is still today a difficult problem, but imagine how challenging and remarkable it was in the 50s. So the perceptron has led to a lot of excitement, both in the field of AI and outside this field, a little bit similar to what is happening, all the hype that happens around, for example, uh, uh, large language models and similar progresses that have happened recently in artificial intelligence. And the, the hype was probably a little bit out of proportion, so you can just recall a 1958 New Yorker article that called perceptrons a first serious rival to the human brain ever devised and even remarkable machines that are capable of what amounts to thought. So with the bar set so high and with this level of expectations, it was clear that a disillusionment would inevitably come and indeed it has come in the form of a book titled Perceptrons, authored by two AI scientists from MIT called Marvin Minsky and Sermot Papert. And in this book, they showed mathematically that Rosenblatt's perceptrons were not very expressive. For example, they could not even learn a very basic logic function such as the exclusive OR. And unfortunately, the publication of this book coincided with funding cuts in the United States and here in the UK, which uh, has led to the first AI winter and the uh, loss of interest in neural networks for many years to come. So it was shown, however, later that if the perceptron is made of multiple connected layers of neurons, what is nowadays called the deep neural network, it can approximate practically any function. But for doing this, it might require an enormous amount of data that also grows exponentially with the number of input dimensions. And this is a phenomenon that is colloquially known as the curse of dimensionality in machine learning and data science. And even for our very modestly sized uh, images of cats and dogs, in our example, there are simply not enough animal in the entire world to train such a neural network because the number of training examples would need to be larger than the number of particles in the entire universe. So a breakthrough in getting around this problem came with a new type of neural network architectures that were initially developed in the 80s in Japan by Kunihiko Fukushima and later famously by Yan Likan. And these architectures were initially inspired by works in neuroscience on the organization of the visual cortex of the brain. 
the neurons in these networks were locally connected with shared parameters that allowed to implement them as a mathematical operation called convolution. And that was coupled with progressive decrease in the image size that in deep learning jargon is called pooling. And originally applied to optical character recognition, convolutional neural networks had a very important property of translation invariance that was baked directly into the architecture. No matter how I move this digit three within the image in this example, I still want to say that this is digit three. And this property comes from the fact that in mathematical terminology, convolution commutes with the translation group. And actually convolutional neural networks are one of the early examples of geometric deep learning architectures that have become very successful in the last 10 years with the increase of compute power and availability of large data sets uh, of images to train such networks. So when you post a photo on a social network, probably there is some convolutional neural network under the hood that looks at your picture and uh, tells, for example, that it is sensitive material that should not be published. So the underlying principles of translational symmetry in convolutional neural networks can be extended to other kinds of objects that we need to deal with in machine learning, for example, networks or graphs or manifolds and meshes. And these objects are often used to model molecular structures in biology and drug design. So if you take this molecule, you're probably all very familiar with it. So this is my favorite molecule. It's called caffeine and we probably never have enough of it during our day. If you wish to predict its chemical or physical properties, which is a very important task when you're designing a new drug, right? You want to virtually screen potential uh, drug candidates, such as, for example, receptor binding energy. Um, for this purpose, you need to arrange somehow the atoms, right? The nodes of this molecular graph uh, in some order. And this order is not intrinsic to the object itself. It's just our way of representing a molecular graph on a computer. So what we need from a neural network in this case is what is called permutation invariance or the independence of the output on the action of a permutation group that acts on the nodes of the molecular graph. Deep neural network architectures with this property are called graph neural networks and they have become very popular in recent years in applications that range from social networks to structural biology and to particle physics. And they've been used successfully to discover new drugs already. For example, a group at MIT a few years ago found that a compound called halicin that was initially tested as an anti-diabetic drug has powerful antibiotic properties using graph neural networks. And with the rise of antibiotic resistance that is now estimated already to kill more than 1 million people worldwide every year, these kind of methods based on geometric deep learning might be the right tool that would allow us to create drugs to prevent the next pandemic. With my colleagues in Switzerland, we've been using geometric deep learning for several years now to design new proteins. As you probably know, these are large biomolecules that can attach themselves chemically or as chemists say, bind protein targets that are difficult to drug otherwise or even impossible to drug. And one example is what is called the program death ligand or PDL1 protein that is used as oncological target in immunotherapy or maybe the, even the spike protein of the coronavirus that has been terrorizing us for the past three years. And protein-based drugs, what is called biologics, are a relatively recent and very exciting therapeutic modality that have seen many successes in the past couple of decades. So I believe that in the next few years, uh, new machine learning methods would create a true revolution in drug design. And same way as nowadays, we have generative diffusion models that can produce very realistic images based on text prompt. And the example that I use here uh, is a, a painting of an astronaut riding a dog on the moon that was completely made up by a neural network. Same way we will have models that can generate novel drug molecules that will give us faster, cheaper and better therapies to diseases that currently have no cure. Thank you very much.